So very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, uh, we're delighted to have Sanjay Nath here with us from Bloom Ventures, who is really going to tell us more about how technology is changing and how, as a VC, they are focusing on new tech startups and new tech ideas going forward. Uh, what is more interesting about 2020, and particularly uh, this COVID times, is that while technology and digital was already there amongst us, but it has sort of firmly put its ground forward now saying that, you know, if you really want to be in business, technology has to be either part of it or you have to be really in a technology business uh, in some way or the other. And I mean, honestly, had it not been for uh, video conferencing and had it not been for technology all around us, our children would not have got educated. They would have actually been sitting doing nothing for the last three months. Our, uh, you know, we would not have been able to talk to our teams. We would not have been able to conduct any kind of business. So it's really thanks to technology that we have been able to continue at least to a very large extent business as usual which would really not have been possible otherwise. So thank you for joining us today, Sanjay. Uh, this is going to be a great talk and I would love to hear some of the ideas that you have. Um, so at Entrepreneur, we continue to look and seek for more business opportunities that are coming up, new startup ideas, plans, what founders are thinking, how technology companies are enabling themselves to a new COVID world, post COVID world that is of course, and we would like to see this uh, ending very quickly. Um, so let me start by asking you this. There has been a lot of change in consumer, in societies at large, not just consumer behavior, but societies have changed because of the pandemic. And uh, a lot of change has been triggered in people, whether it uh, has been about uh, people's consumption or people's comfort. Now, given all of this, at Bloom Ventures, how do you see uh, things changing for you? What kind of new startup ideas, what kind of new technology ideas is it that you are now looking at with the change of uh, society patterns or change of consumption or the entire mindset of the consumer going ahead? Sure. Uh, Ritu, first of all, thanks for having me on. Thanks for having Bloom Ventures on and uh, hope uh, everyone in the audience is uh, well and safe. Uh, you know, just a couple of points before we dive in. Uh, a, this is not only a startup ecosystem uh, phenomenon. It's not only India, it's global, right? It's a global pandemic. So, uh, you know, one caveat I'll say is that we're all learning, right? Those changes that are taking place are happening every day, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, we are past the lockdown sort of four in some cities in India getting into five and also globally. Uh, I talk to my global friends and, you know, this is global, number one. Uh, so, of course, wish everyone safe and well. Um, uh, the second point is that, you know, as a digital VC, we are actually backing companies for the long term uh, with, you know, 10 to 12 year horizon. So, this year, you know, would be obviously defined as like a COVID year or almost like a lockdown year or a washout. So, uh, I think we've got to be careful to see we don't, you know, just come in for something that is just going to be around this period, but they have to obviously last post. Having said that, you know, you talked about societies, right? So if you look at, uh, I'll give you some examples. If you look at, we've got Dunzo, right? Which does delivery. We've got Milk Basket in Delhi. And uh, they're certainly seeing tailwinds in the sense that I think uh, if you look at our favorite restaurants and food, uh, while uh, a lot of restaurants are open, but only for delivery, right? You're seeing that consumer behavior shift where, uh, you know, all of us have learned maybe cooking skills that we've never learned before or had to do household chores, <laughs> all of us, right? Uh, before and after the panel, for example. But I think so delivery is clearly one, uh, uh, you know, one aspect where people say, I still want my, you know, favorite food. And I, you know, here now alcohol is also opening up again. Uh, the other tailwind aspect is look at education, right? I mean, for all of us who have children, uh, we're now uh, each on our virtual classrooms, right? Literally, I'm here at my study desk, let's say the kids are somewhere else. And EdTech is certainly taken off in terms of a tailwind. And it's, in, it's interesting that it will probably continue for, uh, for a while. I mean, we heard, heard of, you know, Stanford, Harvard a couple of years ago through edX making their, uh, uh, you know, classrooms live. But I think now that was, that seemed like, wow, only they can do it. But now everybody's doing it, right? Yeah. Distance learning virtual. So ed edtech is another behavior that's changing. Um, and I, 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 you look at healthcare in terms of telemedicine, right? Where, uh, you know, calling our doctors on video or a Skype and, really deciding. I think one way, the one paradigm is for startups to think your product to the customer, is it a painkiller to use that sort of doctor energy? Is it a painkiller or a vitamin, right? A vitamin is great, but if you don't take it, okay, you might feel a little weaker, but if it's painkiller, you'll have that pain for a while. Yeah. 
So I think today that must have is much more important than the nice to have. It's always important, but today it's been brought to the fore. So I think, uh, uh, you know, I think it's helpful for startups to think about what are the tailwinds and headwinds. In fact, there are always tailwinds and headwinds. It's just where the balance is more. But it's also important for founders. And I think Bloom also is saying is that don't think of it as a fad, right? And say that, okay, okay, opportunistically, like some kids said that everybody started a grocery service, right? Everybody's yeah. getting into it. That's also, again, you're going to have a period of overcrowding, overinvestment, and, you know, again, you'll have deaths there in that sense, uh, figuratively speaking. So I think it's important to really build for the long term and think about, you asked a good question, that what customer behaviors are going to change both on the enterprise side and on the consumer side, uh, uh, irreverse, irre irreversibly, not just during COVID. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, as you mentioned, probably grocery, everybody thought of it as an opportunity and then a lot of people right from, you know, Zomato to done. So everybody's jumped into it. But do you think it's only like a short term uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, so to say, getting over or weathering out the storm and then everybody is going to go back to what is it that they really yeah. belong to? Yeah. Well, you know, let's take a step back. I mean, I'm not a healthcare expert, but, you know, till the actual vaccine is out, right? And we know our own Serum Institute in Pune has been doing great work. Mr. Purnala was speaking. Till the vaccine is out, it's all speculation and wishful thinking and hoping for the best, right? Now, once the vaccine is out and we're all inoculated, then hopefully the whole real estate, restaurant, and uh, I would say the consumer industry will come back to normal, right? Uh, for one day. Uh, so in, in one sense, I think that delivery option at home, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, I mean, let, let's talk about the future of work, right? Uh, I think that's a good example to talk about. We've got Tap Chief in our own portfolio. We have FRAP that does for students. I think the concept of the office itself, ha not is going to change, has changed. Yeah. Look at tech giants and uh, uh, pioneers like Facebook and Google. They've made work from home uh, uh, optional for the end of the year, not the end of the month, the end of the year, but not even to the second half of the year. Right? And these, this is, these are from Silicon Valley. Yeah. Which means that now people are saying, okay, you know, I can order home. I can also work from home. Now that has productivity issues, but they, these are also opportunities for you're seeing tools like, of course, we're on Zoom, you've got GoToMeeting, you've got AirMeet, there's going to be whiteboarding tools. Again, that's an opportunity, you know, coming up from a sort of negative situation. Yeah. So lots of ancillary opportunities will come up, but there's very clear enterprise behavior is going to move more and more towards the cloud, you know, less away from on-premise, which means how we sell to them is also going to change. You know, we have portfolio companies in Silicon Valley that are basically selling by Zoom and, uh, uh, and email. Because earlier, uh, only the salesperson was remote. Now, assuming, you know, I see you sitting in your living room, the customer, the CEO sitting in his living room, right? So there's that uh, feeling of equalization. So um, uh, certainly behavior is changing. Uh, and some of the behavior may be semi-permanent, some may be temporary, but uh, I think startups should certainly think you know, one question I'll leave with before the next, your next uh, question is, I think startups, I would say, think about how your customer's business is changing. Sure. You know, then you can uh, adapt to how you're going to change to them, right? How, what, what is your, how is your customer's own business changing? What are they thinking about inside in their boardroom? Absolutely. I completely agree with you there. Um, you know, now, um, so Bloom Ventures, I know, has been formed very interestingly. I mean, I remember I've been following the fund uh, for the last almost, uh, I think, six years now. And uh, what I have seen is that you've sort of gone into the space, which is really not really the early uh, or the angel space, and it's not really the late stage space either. And then you also look at ideas which are not that mainstream at that point of time when you invest in them, but they're likely to become mainstream. So now, given the fact that we are sitting on today where, you know, uh, as you yourself said, that things have changed and people are now selling on Zoom or some other channels, how is it that you see uh, things changing? I mean, you know, as a fund, what is your direction going to be? What technology trends are you looking at as we sit uh, at work from home yeah. to invest in the future? Yeah. No, it's interesting, you know, in half jest, we would often, uh, uh, you know, we would always talk about, you know, those VCs, those VCs being different. And now that, you know, we've become like a pre-series fund and quite institutional, uh, you know, people are saying, see, I told you that one day you would also become a VC, right, in one sense. But, uh, you know, I would say that uh, early stages are in our DNA, right? We like to work with founders. We like to actually roll up our sleeves and look at them pre-idea stage. 
whether it is pre MEP, post MEP, the whole idea is that you're sh helping shape and influence and uh, suggest the business. Um, I think uh, now the bar for entrepreneurship and founders has become much higher post COVID, right? Which means if you look at it, uh, you can call it like a fat engagement pipe, which means it is an investor's market. All our pipeline is very strong, right? I mean, we've got like the number of pitches, you've become quite a large team. I lose uh, a contact with the number of LinkedIn messages, pitches, uh, uh, which means that we're all uh, generally I think the industry is examining proposals much more, but the time to closure is much longer and the percentage of closure is also much smaller, right? Because so, so one is that the bar is higher in one sense. Um, to your point, I think about uh, why we moved up, uh, uh, you know, I think it's a function of scale also where you see uh, the fact is that today companies want to think about going global from day one. Oyo obviously has its, had its own issues, but you know, at its peak, it was pretty amazing to see, right? There were case study at Harvard Business School, uh, the international expansion, uh, you know, we have other companies. And so for that, you need a little extra capital, right? Because you've got to break through those markets and hire. So um, I would say it's logical. Now, having said that, we have Arca Venture Labs, which has kept us very true to our early roots. It does enterprise B2B acceleration. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we selectively will look at uh, you know, we've always thought about having a scout program and a scout check, uh, you know, like some other VCs do. But the fact is that even if we don't invest as early as we do, we like to track companies early and we like to be helpful uh, early on, right? So we, we do mentoring and we, uh, uh, we like to get involved early. Sure. So, um, I mean, you've also sort of had this opportunity fund that you launched just, uh, uh, just prior to the pandemic, really. I mean, I yeah. think it was in yeah. February. And you also mentioned that, you know, a lot of this fund would actually be directed to your existing portfolio company, yep. wherein, you know, and some of the existing portfolio companies, particularly I've been following the progress of an academy, you know, because yeah. online education has become such a strong yeah. today. I mean, do you, how has your um, um, strategy changed in house? Are you still looking to do that or are you, because I mean, I, if I were to really see, I've also seen how, how much, uh, 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 a platform like uh, online events or just online conferencing becomes such a big platform. I mean, while it's, it, it's not as if it was not there earlier, it was around, but the, yeah. the whole usage and uh, the whole, uh, and I mean, I think going forward, we will see a lot of uh, different kind of usage happening over here where people will not just talk, but people will be able to engage with a lot of other people that they want to across the world. So, I mean, how do you see your opportunity fund panning out now? Um, once, uh, I mean, I think we're open really. So how, how do you see things? Yeah. Well, um, uh, you know, the premise of setting up an opportunity fund, and you know, there are a couple of other funds that have also done that in the Valley and Southeast Asia, so it's popular. The premise of that is basically to support your winners, right? And to not just winners, but provide more support for your portfolio companies. Uh, so we have gone deeper in investment and broader on the platform. And I'll explain that, right? Uh, deeper on the investment is simple, right? In consumer company like an academy or uh, uh, let's say there's Dunzo or Spinny, the fact is that to build a brand, you need to raise capital, right? Because you have to acquire those customers, you have to get known. And typically consumer companies uh, raise more. Of course, I think good behavior that the COVID situation will force is much more attention to the bottom line, to part to profitability and basically positive unit economics, right? which is good, which is a positive change across the industry. Um, so uh, I, I think the option you find is very simple. You want to support your companies. Uh, they've always thought of blooming helpful and you go deeper in capital. But we've also expanded on the platform side. So uh, you probably know that we have a large platform team as well, right? So we have a, a shared services affiliate team called Constellation, which basically helps with finance and accounting. We have Passion Connect that actually helps with hiring, yeah. like we hires and hiring, which is outside of Bloom. Then within the Bloom team, the platform team, we have um, we have a uh, you know we have a resource that helps them with business development. We have another resource that actually helps them with fundraising. Then we have community, we have operations. So there's an investment team and a platform team, and the idea is that you can uh, we we don't believe you can just help in just terms of giving them more capital. But the idea of the option fund and Bloom is scale in terms of the platform, right? Can you help them in ways outside the boardroom, outside the quarterly board meeting, right? In ways beyond just capital and strategic advice. So kind of like uh, a first round model or like Andreessen Horowitz, right? Where you, you're, it's almost like you're a company and you're helping your startup 
uh, founders on multiple elements, not just capital. Yeah. And I mean, the fact now that you mentioned the startup founders and you know how much is it that you're doing for them, how are you today, uh, I mean, helping the startup founders on another level, which is really, I would say, on a level where they are today extremely stressed out. They feel that, you know, things around them are not working or as planned. I mean, sure, everybody set up their targets in January 2020 uh, for what they were looking to achieve this year. For most of us, it's not going uh, that way. So what is it that you're telling them right now so that they're able to plan themselves better? How are, how are you asking them to repurpose their business? I know you mentioned about grocery being one of the areas for a lot of consumer tech companies, but I mean, you know, on an emotional level, on a personal level, how is it that you're asking them to deal with the teams? How you're asking them to deal with, uh, you know, their customers, how to engage better with them and largely what kind of leadership skills do they need to imbibe today in order to be able to survive this and sail through the pandemic? No, that's a great question. Actually, that gets to the heart of the situation and because we're still not out of the situation. So what we did, I think in general, a best practice and a principle we've seen is that the best founders and the best CEOs or the best leaders, which is very easy to say, difficult to do, is that you can communicate and over-communicate all kinds of news, bad news and good news. Also share. I think a lot of us, I mean, what, what are VCs and CEOs? We're all human beings at the end of the day, right? Uh, we some It's very difficult to share because people feel that it's a sign of weakness if you share, right? If you show your vulnerability. So a couple of things we did. Uh, we went, uh, we got uh, very, very soon in the crisis. We actually met a couple of experts, not experts, but, uh, but successful CEOs who've been through multiple crises and actually share their own experiences, what mistakes they made, uh, right? Right from... Uh, the, the dot com, uh, the bust uh, to 9/11 to the financial downturn to, uh, of course, to Y2K, uh, uh, right? And uh, that gave founders, uh, you know, a lot of assurance that okay, this is not just me, right? Because the CEO job is very lonely. People say, all oh, right, only I'm getting hit, and then suddenly you say, no, there are 20 other portfolio company CEOs that are going through the same thing. The second thing we did was we organized these cohorts. Uh, we actually club startups together and said, okay, series B, series C funded startups consumer, high consumer spend, B2B, and, and got CEOs and uh, CEOs, to, CXOs to share, right? Uh, how they are thinking. So Ritu, I'll share with you. Uh, I mean, these are Bloom funded companies where it's painful. So imagine early stage startups that have not even raised funding, how painful it's going to be, right? I'm sure. Uh, 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 but it's, it's always painful, right? Just the degree of pain and how you can alleviate it. Um, so basically, um, you know, there was a lot of powerful sharing. I mean, deep rooted sharing like, okay, instead of layoffs, what if the CEOs take a pay cut? Then how much should you take the pay cut? So you do, you do tiered pay cuts, right? For example, the lowest uh, rungs on the ladder, you don't uh, lay them off or you don't do pay cuts at all. And the CEOs, let's say, to 50%. I mean, just as an example, right? That showed that you're taking that pain from the top. And that sharing very early after the crisis hit was very helpful, I think, to our portfolio. And we, we then almost three, four sessions, we ran almost a session every day, getting these outside experts, like on a regular basis. And I think that helped, just sh the sharing helped and it alleviated the pain that we're all going through this together, that sense of empathy developed, right? Yeah. Now, now moving this to a business side, uh, because ultimately it's all about finance. The, the one thing uh, we advise uh, is that the only control variable you can control is your costs, right? Okay. You can't control when the customer is going to pay you if you're going to have customers at all. So cut your costs immediately, cut non-essentials, uh, you know, maybe let offices go or negotiate rent, uh, uh, you, know, uh, zoom, you know, cut your Zoom from 100 licenses to 20 licenses, whatever, right, everything. And lengthen the runway, so then you have time and you're not under pressure that I've got to raise money, I've got to raise money, right, just lend it. If you have six months, lend it to 12 months. So these are some things both on the soft and the hard side uh, we found and but that sharing uh, I think was very helpful. Sure, I completely agree. And you also mentioned that, you know, the, the very, very early stage startups, they might not make out of this at all. So, I mean, you know, what kind of, um, I mean, collaboration or any kind of uh, strategy you can give to them to be able to, uh, you know, so that they just don't die. I mean, it's very easy to weather away right now and nobody is going to sort of, uh, blame you for it either, but is there some way they can make out of it? No, I, I mean, there's no, uh, there's no formula or panacea in that sense, but just a couple of like first principles, right? I think one is 
if you're on the B2B side, I'll just segregate uh, because there are lots of B2B businesses also. I would say it's really important to reduce the churn and keep your customers close, right? Your, your enterprise sales because at this time, I think, you know, move from, I mean, we like to say move from uh, sales mode to empathize mode, right? A relationship manager mode. This is, think of this, the, the existing customer relationship as a relationship. You've got to maintain that. You've got to grow that. You've got to protect that. New business development, have somebody else in the team look at because if you try to do everything and you have, your churn is very high, then it's a big problem because new business, so, uh, uh, I mean, new business development, people take your calls, but it take long to convert. So that's one. Um, uh, I, I think the second aspect is, uh, again, like I said, you know, cut your non-essential costs, which is very important. And think of the positive side of the silver linings, right? For example, I think, you know, tailwinds. I mean, people talk a lot about this. There can be a tail went for the entire industry. For example, EdTech is an example. I mean, for EdTech, this is a fantastic tailwind. All virtual, all online. But there can also be tailwinds within uh, uh, within a business, right? So just for example, uh, like say for a locus, right? Locus, our locus does route optimization. Now it's got a customer that is like a grofers or big basket. Now for big basket, grofers now, delivery itself is very important, Yeah. right? Uh, the safety of that delivery, uh, how long it takes, where does it go from, which is always important in normal times, but normal times is how quickly can you deliver your incentives, right? Now today the writer intensive is safety, right? Okay. So then think about the tailwinds within your industry, within your customers, right? So I think it's also time for customers to step back and say, you know, how is my, for entrepreneurs to say, how is my customer's business going to change? What is the future uh, like of healthcare, like telemedicine, for example, right? What was cool now, now becomes very important. So mm. I think I think you just have to be uh, adjust and be dynamic, but cutting costs is important because it gives you the leeway to not rush into desperate or foolish decisions or be pressured by an investor who's giving you a bad deal. And then you've got to take it because you have only three months of cash. If you've cut costs and, and lengthen your runway, then you can think a little with a clearer head. Sure. You know, um, now, um, Sanjay, in today's time, if a startup is looking, and I mean, let's say a very, very early stage startup is looking to uh, raise capital, what kind of projections will you look at uh, from the startup? I mean, given the fact that it's hard to predict what business will look like or how consumers will come to happen for the business in, in the coming months. So on what basis are you, on what parametrics are you going to uh, sort of say that, okay, this is, they look promising and we can invest in them? Yeah. No, I think there are two things. It's a, it's a tough question, which is why I think, uh, you know, for new companies, all VCs and investors are taking their time, right? For example, if it was taking, let's say, six, three months to look at something, it's probably going to take four to five months, maybe even six. Mm -hmm. um, I think it starts with the thought process, right? That painkiller, I'll use that painkiller versus, uh, let's take an example, like, let, let's say, let's say, let's say, uh, uh, oh, let's say ed tech, let's say ed tech. Now you've got schools reopening, supposedly reopening in June, but Bombay's hit badly here. Bangalore's opened up. I think, I don't know how Delhi's, I think Delhi is better than Bombay, but schools are supposed to reopen, but let's say they don't reopen, right? Now a startup is in edtech saying that, you know, I'm going to, let's create a, like a WhatsApp like interface and I'm going to enable these teachers. Uh, now a big problem for schools is they, that, that the schools themselves are not set up for virtual environment. Forget the students. Students may have a, a laptop and a Wi-Fi in their living room and a router, but what if the school itself is not? What if the teachers mm. are not? Mm. So let's say there's a software solution that enables that, for example. Now that is very interesting, right? Because you basically, uh, or, or, or like this air meet, this video conference tool, or like a whiteboarding, like how do, how do we whiteboard? It's so difficult when we all can't get together, right? Now, uh, you know, we're sitting here on Zoom and I can share my screen, but if there's a whiteboarding tool, that is very interesting because that might take off even more now. You know, everybody has a need for that. So I'm saying, how is the startup thinking about that pain point for the customer? And where can you show some proof traction? You know, you know we realize that all started and we're not going to look for some massive traction, but is that a really different need, you know, hmm. versus everybody doing grocery? Of course, grocery is important, but why are you the best, right? You know, how are you going to compete with the Swiggy Zomato? So I actually think if you think about it, Ritu, JD.com in China and Airbnb and uh, Uber were also all started after the downturns. JD was started after the SaaS downturn. Right. Right. Because, yeah. because malls were closed and he said, I'll set up an online store because uh, people weren't going there. 
so you know an entrepreneurship is all about that right so it's going to be painful but there will be some new opportunities that come up yeah absolutely agree with you but now that you mentioned you've touched upon retail a bit in fact we're getting questions uh, some one question that has come from one of our attendee is that uh they have a restaurant so does it make sense for them to go into a dark kitchen model and you know save on all the uh, physical costs which is rent labor and so on yeah. so i mean if what what would be your advice to a conventional business how can they sort of uh, make that change yeah. or do a change yeah. sure yeah i'm not a, you know we don't typically invest in a space i'm not an expert but i do have views for example i've talked to uh some founders who who run some of these coffee shops and the chains right. uh, again i think looking at the tails in the sector so while without being prescriptive with this advice i would say um obviously delivery is going to take off like for example if somebody delivers uh, uh, produces great coffee uh, coffee beans delivered or the actual coffee being delivered is a great idea uh, you know right here in uh, bombay i've seen pictures of this nice south indian dive cafe matunga that opened and it has these fiber glass barriers for them it works well because for fast food you are in and out in 5 minutes mm. versus a fine dining you're coming there for the experience the fine dining will be hit more in terms of the restaurants because you're coming there for the experience not just for the food right uh, in a in a dipping cafe or in and out but i think the dark kitchens also make sense uh, because you we are seeing actually a surge of cloud kitchen proposals yes right okay uh because people are getting tired right of obviously of cooking at home and then ordering from swiggy and zomato all the time and say wow this is something you let me try it uh and uh, uh look at that, right i mean uh home chefs may take off right delivery will again take off so i think there'll be a lot of inter uh, inter and intercity del- all this stuff to be delivered right yeah so right. I, i i think it's interesting for delivery but yes i think that's not a bad idea uh but but i'm sure it'll come back i'm sure it's going to come back right i mean uh, in basically is going out and all is a very important part of what we do and again i think when the vaccine is closer where there's there are more health uh, uh, sort of the flags are off it'll come back yeah i agree with you you know somebody is also asked about hospitality and mobility how are these sectors going to get impacted hospitality and mobility are two very different sectors uh unfortunately hospitality is a bit immobile at the moment Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, uh, you look at everything from if I if I look at airlines to hotels. Uh, you know, somebody like me who travels every week. Uh, uh, you know, I miss that. Uh, it is tough because they're the hardest hit, uh, and they're looking at ancillaries. For example, uh, you know, maybe taking advance bookings or online discovery of experiences, uh, d- different models. Uh, I think mobility has come back. You know, we had Yulu bike. which yeah. was shut for a couple of months because the gov- the government had put down its comeback actually i think cycle cycling is very interesting because it's non invasive you're alone you have a mask versus a pillion rider or a uber car because you're traveling with somebody else in a cycle it's open air and uh, you're breathing the clean air uh, uh, and and on a positive side if you look at delhi it's probably had never had cleaner air than ever before yes correct uh, the air quality index say qi um uh, but it's going to be tough and i think the entrepreneurs have to look within that right within mobility what will change so uh, it's a great opportunity i think for the government to look at bicycle lanes yes um public transportation might get hit a bit because you know i think sentiment is going to be to avoid that right uh, to avoid that so there may be barriers there may be uh, i think social distancing uh, that's going to become the norm but different aspects may change within mobility hospitality i think would take some time to come back it's going to be tough yeah i mean yeah. i mean i mean i meant i meant uh, travel and tourism and hotels and and airlines yes of course i mean i mean for us i mean as a media probably mice we don't know when will it come back because that's that's one of the areas where we get so, people to meet each other and network with each other so yeah so i'll give you i'll give you an example yeah. i'll give you an example and i'm happy to make this intro there's this very innovative startup that i just met last week i mean when i met by zoom and what they've come up with is it's a ar vr tool actually more for industrial but they they some of the conferences are using them because you create these avatars of ritu and sanjay right. and uh, and uh, you essentially uh, you know in that conference room you have a jet pack you can actually fly in the air and you can whiteboard you can actually conduct sessions and while that is you know it was cute it is quite interesting because you know we are part of the deeper venture network uh, and the others it everything is moving to virtual 
so uh, 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 i'm quite sure that you know touch wood we all come back and we all safe and you start your events again but we always might have a virtual option for people to dial in right okay. and for that there are tools around that so you the, i think i think once it comes back it may be one of the biggest industries to innovate for because advertisers and companies are willing to spend it is just that they do it in a different way and yeah. i think technology may have a very interesting role to play in that because people are really going to say if i have for 3 months uh, uh, if i have not moved from gurgaon to noida right then why would i get, a, get on a plane and go to bangalore right for this yeah so so uh, that might also be uh, technology might have a lot big option inside uh, mysore sure and you know i mean now that you mentioned about uh, this platform i know highland is doing something similar they they're building like a roblox for adults where in you know essentially uh, people can be going out doing social stuff uh, and yeah so i mean that now that you mentioned a use case for mice also this might just become the the way of doing business but you know let me just uh, now uh, i mean that you said i know if our e-commerce companies for the last 5 or 7 years they uh, sort of just to get to closer to the customer they've done what you call these digital models physical and digital models do you think that's likely to change they're not going to sort of invest and they they put some significant investment in opening stores and experience centers so do you think that is likely to change in the coming times that's a good question see i think uh, the ones where it was uh, for for depends on for what they set up the physical ones if i think if it is a with a flagship store uh, then i don't think it's as much an issue right because most of but having said that of course i think the proportion of online sales will definitely go up hmm. uh, um and as long as you have not overspent and you know just burnt a lot of cash in setting up like 20 stores in every city i think it's fine if you have one flagship store it's fine because when things come back there is a certain branding and goodwill associated with that right uh, but but i'll give an example look at like a spinny right i use car marketplace or look at cars now of course if it's a top if it's india one and if they're luxury cars then you know you want to have a flagship store but i see even in luxury cars i've seen that uh, uh, the end to end experience can be done online right because you know what that car is like and if you look at spinny very interestingly we just use us um in china what we've seen is that uh, uh, we just heard that it, this this covid is actually there's a spike in private car ownership right because people are saying i don't want to take the risk of you know just changing a uber ola driver every day uh, uh and you know self driving is a pain uh but uh, i don't mind buying a second second hand cheaper car yeah so, so uh, first time uh, uh, first time car usage of second hand cars will will take off as a positive thing because it, it might cre- create uh, uh, i mean pollution problems obviously because there may be more cars on the road uh, but uh, you know there are those levers so i think uh, i think it depends but the proportion of digital to physical will definitely change in fact i, I mean that's a interesting example to bring in geo geo so right to bring yeah, geo yeah that's over. right yeah so i mean for particularly from geo i mean you know if you've seen i mean while the whole pandemic thing and they've gone out and raised about 12 billion dollars so i mean honestly what they're looking to build is a digital model really you know where there are already an existing uh, uh, you know inventory of physical stores that exist which is close to neighborhoods and everything and they're going to add a digital layer to it and make it easy for them to be able to communicate with their customers and social commerce particularly from where what i am seeing of this is like the, the the blow up of social commerce so what 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 do you think i mean um, or what what are you thinking that geo is going to do which is so interesting in order to uh, bring this digital uh, together yeah no i think what it's i mean certainly a landmark deal um, uh, you know only somebody like him uh, could mukti uh, bhai could pull it off i think what's it it's an interesting is this accelerated this uh, digital move Uh, to the four uh, of of you had uh, you had the, this fragmented kirana tech right uh, all the shopkeepers who uh, you know maybe never never use desktops and suddenly everything is available on the mobile right today your mobile is a computer you have apps today like khata book and things like that uh, we have our own love local which is earlier empani that is catering to that uh, uh, and and uh, you know reed hoffman right the founder of linkedin uh, basically says that you know you can have an average uh, an average product with a great distribution platform 
is better than a great product with a poor distribution platform, right? What it's basically done is it's just given this massive distribution platform to be able to reach, you know, beyond the metros into India 2.0 and India 3.0. Uh, and it's brought digital to the forefront, right? Where, where, where uh, I think shopkeepers and all the merchants are really thinking about di digital as a delivery channel, as a fintech channel to accept payments. Uh, and and uh, um, uh, uh, you know, it, I, it's, it's just brought digital to the fore. My, our, my colleague Sajid Pai has written extensively about this book as he covers the space. Absolutely social commerce. We've got Little Black Book in Delhi, right? Which, uh, which does content has built a great community online, offline, but it also does social commerce. Um, I was really amazed to see the number of, if you look at the rise of organic, right? Organic chips, uh, everything. Uh, uh, I mean, today there are, it's amazing on the social side, there are sanitary pads for women, organic sanitary pads. You know, there is a market for everything. And I think it's wonderful where this distribution platform can put all these products in the hands of, uh, uh, you know, the user. So uh, I'd imagine, I mean, what is it? Who is not a digital business today, right? Everybody is a tech business. You yeah. cannot, you cannot not ignore it. So I think it's just brought uh, Reliance. Reliance has put India on the map again in that sense. But I mean, do you feel that human capital of India is ready to sort of? And I mean, this is a question that somebody has asked on Facebook, which where they say that do you think the talent is ready to perform online and be able to monetize it uh, to that extent that they've been able to do in physical environments? The great question. So, um, um, so a couple of things. If you think about, if you go back to outsourcing, right? I mean, what was outsourcing? Uh, I'm uh, joking, but it was like work from home version 1.0, right? Or work from office. In yeah. one I think our India's, and we'll always be. I think we are the world's talent hub, right? Uh, if you look at everything, everybody from Sundar at Google to Satya at Microsoft, right? I mean, some of the top, we know this, some of the top CEOs are Indians, right? But most of the time, they're always going abroad. Uh, this is, the, and I, I, when I say Bangalore, I mean India, but this is a fantastic opportunity for Bangalore uh, to basically the whole future of work, right? People are really thinking that, like somebody tweeted, right? I think Anand Mahindra tweeted or retweeted, uh, there was a tweet that said that uh, if Google is, uh, and I'm saying this in the politically correct way, if Google and Facebook are going to have everybody working from home, then you need to pay an engineer 250,000 and sit in North Carolina or Virginia when equal quality work can be done for Bangalore or Gurgaon, right? right. What is McKinsey's knowledge center? The same thing. I mean, McKinsey has been doing this for 20 years. Uh, uh, it's not new, right? It's just that uh, we'll be calling it work from home now. So I think it's a fantastic option for the, in fact, I think the option for human capital is even more because the new, the globally distributed organization is going to say, okay, our customers here, see, where, even where the sales need to be, even sales may be remote. So why does tech have to be there? There's no chance, there's no reason for tech to be on premise. It could be anyway. So Tapchi, for example, one of our companies, it is basically a future of work platform that has uh, knowledge workers, right? Uh, on one side and enterprises on the other. And uh, like what Elan started doing. So this is not new. But I think this is a very interesting tailwind opportunity for India's talent. So I, actually, I think the human capital side is the biggest opportunity. Reskilling. Uh, I would encourage younger founders to think about, or founders or even students, right? To think about that. What are the skills of the future? Um, you know, the ways universities. Uh, I have a teenage uh, uh, teenage son. Uh, we're doing virtual webinars every other day. Uh, they're all uh, uh, Ritu. The universities are coming and marketing to you. <laughs> That's right. Normally, you have to go and visit. I want to go to Delhi. I want to go to London. And you have to go. Uh, universities are saying sign up for a webinar. <laughs> They're pitching to you. Yeah. That's right? Right. So it's a very interesting opportunity. Yeah, I can tell you I have a young daughter about uh, 8 and 10. And there was a coding school which has sent me about 15 messages just to come and take a coding trial class. You know, So it's, it's to that extent where, and you know, it might just, the kids might just hook up to it. I mean, I've been uh, trying to figure out how to get my kids uh, to at least learn some basic coding. And, yeah. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, you know, everything uh, silver lining, right? I mean, this is a great option for all of us to learn and spend time with reading a book or learning a new skill. I, I mean, the number of bachelors that have learned cooking. Okay, <laughs> who, Thanks you to know, YouTube. Who, who in normal times, they never would. 
or a great time to learn a new skill like coding in this time, which in normal times you're spending that two, three hours in commute, you never will. So there's a huge positive side to this. Yeah, absolutely. So there's another question. We've got very macro question though from Harsh Yadav, uh, who's saying that, how do you think India is going to perform economically in the coming days? I mean, you know, what is our economics going to look like? No, I think, uh, you know, th this is a tough problem to solve. Uh, uh, you know, we are still in the stages of lockdown, but we have a billion people. And I think we are the least socially distanced. I mean, our propensity for it, this cultural area, it's very difficult to keep uh, all of us apart. Um, I think the growth rate was revised a bit, right? I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know we were not at six, maybe we're even lower now. Uh, but the fact is, I think digital can play a huge role. Um, if you look at on the fintech side, all the innovation with everything from the Arogya Setu app to UPI and to, uh, uh, you know, all the developments in fintech, I think are a big enabler. Uh, we are very bullish on agri-tech, for example, which is yeah. one of India's largest, uh, uh, I mean, our core agri uh, uh, you know, uh, economies that Gandhiji was also very proud about. Um, how do you, you know, fintech and mobile, how do you put power in the hands of the farmers? Uh, there's going to be disruption in the global supply chain and logistics, but the fact is that uh, uh, everything from, uh, um, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've actually invested in a robotics company that basically helps farmers track their crops, uh, you know, better, you know, which are, which have high yield. And so you've also got the marrying of uh, high tech and agri today. So I think overall we'll do fine. Obviously there's a lot of short term pain um, and there's, so, there's social pain also. But again, I don't want to make any political comments. Look at the rest of the mess of the world. I think we are not too bad, right? If you see yeah. what's happening, happening in the Western world, I think uh, you know we have everybody uh, at least uh, thinking about this. A country like Singapore, which has five million people, has struggled to deal with this. Has not come out of it. Five million people versus one point three billion people. Correct. So of course, there's pain, but I mean, you know, each state is bigger than you know almost the whole of Europe put together, right? So it's a massive. Uh, as a problem we have to deal with. Yeah. yeah, but you know, the, the, the downside also of having this human capital is that and particularly what we've seen in India with a lot of people who've lost their jobs and there is a big uh, amount of unemployment today. So do you think for them today, because now they're out of jobs and it's quite likely that at least till, uh, there's some correction happens in the economy, it will not be possible to find a viable job again. So do you think it's a good time for them to do a startup or do you think it should, one should still wait and watch? I think it depends. It's a it's a very personal. Uh, I think you're talking about young. You're talking about young professionals who are. Uh, who, yeah, I mean, who, no. I think honestly, for senior professionals, it's going to be a bigger challenge. People who've been working for 15, 16 with a big sort of uh, package that they always had. Well, so let me put it. Yeah, go, go ahead. I I would say you know running a startup is one of the most difficult things, even when things are going well. Uh, a series, you, you may be a CEO of a series C star, uh, funded startup. I always feel the more money you have, the more problems you have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have series C funded startups, you have to deal, you have to lay off 300 people. Uh, if, if, you know, if you're, uh, if you're uh, I mean, you have different problems of scale, the problems don't go away. I think it all depends on what problem you're solving, right? I would say, uh, I'd, I'd never think of, you know, advising people and saying, become a startup founder. It's like, what problem are you solving? And if you have a problem, the whole startup forms around you. Uh, I would, when I say wait and watch, I think it's good to discover. It depends what the person wants to do. You know, one thing I would say to audience is, uh, Ritu, is people feel that uh, if they have to get involved in a startup, they have to start something on their own. And that's not true at all. There are so many ways to dabble in it, to dip in it, right? Uh, somebody's father or uncle may become an angel investor. You can join a startup. You can mentor a startup. You can consult with the startup. You can become a vendor. There are so many ways to get involved. I don't think it would mean, oh, you have to be the founder and CEO and have a tag, right? Uh, I, I think that's very important. And, and even worse, sometimes they think, oh, I have to get VC funded. Not at all, right? I think find a f problem. And if you have enough customers, everything else follows. So yeah. I, I'm away from tags and things like this, you know. Uh, uh, you know, suddenly from 20 years ago with startup founders, if you're a startup founder, it would be difficult to get married because your father-in-law would you know, worry, you know, what, what the hell you're doing. To Suddenly, it became extremely fashionable to say you're a startup founder. So I think it is more about the problem that is solving. Yeah. So we've got some questions. Amansi, can we give audio to uh, Neeraj Gupta? Would that be possible? Or I can just read out his question otherwise.
Okay. Um, so Sanjay is basically asking, um, I mean, you know, if you were to choose between health tech and ed tech, what are you likely to choose? As an investor or as a, as as a investor, founder? Yes. No, it's a difficult, uh, uh, I won't say it's a one size fits all. Certainly ed tech has tailwinds now, right? But remember, that means everybody in ed tech is also going after that, right? So somebody who is, you might think of doing something and somebody who has $15 million in funding may also have the same idea. So because it's a tailwind doesn't mean that you're going to be successful, number one. Uh, I think again, comes back to the problems. So, so let me be more specific. Like if you look at telemedicine and healthcare, or if you look, look at like recently, I came across a startup that was, that was doing AI for maternal care, okay, or say fetal care or things like that. If it's some, or, or let's say it has something to do with the vaccine, okay, then uh, then that's very interesting because that has a much larger purpose also, right? You yeah. used that word purpose also earlier. So I think it depends on the landscape on what the problem is and uh, why you and the team are the best uh, to solve that. Right, you know, this is not a public market where we say, okay, let's buy the stock, right? Uh, uh, you know, let's buy the stock because it's in the sector. It is why is this team and the founder the best? Yeah. But that's very important. Sure. Somebody is asking, do you see any scope of cross-border payment startups now? Like cross-border remittances, this is, or what, what, what kind of... Bansi, is it possible to give uh, the audio to Rahil Himani? Okay, uh, Rahil, please unmute and ask. Go ahead, Rahil. Hello. Go ahead. So, actually, I am planning to start a startup in cross border payment, which is uh, actually. You. Can I uh, ask questions in QA? the tab below. Yeah, yeah, we've seen your question, which is really about cross-border payments. What kind of cross-border payments are you looking at? Just transferring money uh, across countries. Remittances, really. Okay, so Sanjay, more about remittances. Yeah, 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 we, we've, uh, thank you. Thanks for the question. We've seen this uh, model before. I, I, it, is, it is interesting in the sense that uh, if I look at it today versus a couple of years ago, uh, you know, there is going to be less physical movement, right? Where earlier, you know, people would come and do it themselves. So I think in that sense, it is interesting. I know a couple of startups that do global remittances and you can even focus on different segments because you can, you know, do it for different uh, layers of uh, the workforce, right? Right from top professionals to, you know, more the working class. Now, I don't have more details on that, but it seems interesting. And of course, you have to have a core competency in that, but uh, uh, I'll have to examine more, but I, uh, but yeah, it's possible that, that that could be interesting. Sure. So there's another question which has come, uh, which says that essentially, you know, it's not that good for businesses to pivot. But I mean, now given the situation that we are in, would you suggest startup founders to pivot their business model entirely? It depends on the alternative. If the alternative is to pivot or die, then you have to pivot, right? So. Um, See, I think it depends. It really depends on what the situation is, right? There are no, there are no formula. So I'll give you an example. You're in the travel business, right? Let's take a non-tech business and you're a hotel owner and uh, you people just stop traveling. If you don't pivot, you're going to die, right? What do you do? I mean, so what else can you do that is related to your ancillary? Uh, or uh, the reason people got into grocery uh, uh, delivery was because you suddenly saw a massive consumer shift of people staying at home but ordering. So it makes sense, right? So it's driven by consumer demand. So I, do, I don't think, it, I, you know, I never say you should pivot or you should not pivot. It really depends on what your situation is and what you're pivoting to. Um, so it really depends on how badly your industry has also been hit. So for example, the opposite of pivoting is doubling down, right? So if you're seeing something that works like in edtech education, investing in a platform that can reduce latency or, you know, improve speed by 2x or enable uh, uh, virtual classrooms, then I would double down on that, right? Or if it's an ed tech company with learning centers, and suddenly you see all your customers work on your online, of course, I would pivot. I think the word, yeah. pivot also, the word pivot is also sometimes overused. I think it is more adjusting to the customer and adjusting, 
tailoring your solution to the customer need. Sure. Um, so there's another question which has come when I mean, they're going, going on and on in one place or the other. So is what, what future do you see for the construction in the real estate industry? Do you think uh, it's going to change in some way? Yeah, that's a bit out of my domain. Um, I think now here's what's interesting. I'm looking from the tech side. I think digital platforms or technology for the construction industry will take off, can take off, right? Which actually, uh, you know, says that, you know, what parts of that can be designed online, what can be designed, you know, from uh, digitally, for example, and what has to be done, uh, you know, on the premise. Uh, on the real industry, we have our own rail yatri, right? Our, which is now rebranded as Intercity, which is doing the buses more than trains. Um, there could be different forms of, uh, you know, of, of uh, rail travel, I think, but that's a bit out, out of my domain. And for the moment, it's been hit world over, right? With metros and everything stopped just because of this, uh, the, the lack of the vaccine and yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, while we were talking about Pivot earlier, as a fund, do you see this could be a time for Pivot? I mean, you could look at more later stage investments also, uh, given that, you know, some sectors, companies in your own portfolio companies are going to see some big rise and you might want to invest in them going ahead further. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, it's all relative. Like for us, like data stage means like investing 5 million is data stage, right? For some people, uh, you know, the minimum check size or first check size is like 20 million. Um, whether we do late stage or not, I think the fact is to always come in early, right? Because our DNA, uh, the two, you know, bloom is to actually, a lot of people use the word founder friendly, but we actually like to come in, roll up our sleeves, work with them, sometimes post an idea, sometimes before that. So even if you do late stage, you're still starting at the same point, right? Uh, having said that, we moved more to pre -A. Uh, but you bring up a larger point. I think that the bar for entrepreneurship has been raised even more. I, what the message to the founders is that, uh, you know, if it was going to take, well, if you, if you, earlier it was okay to have, let's say nine months of cash in the bank, today you need to have 15 months. Okay. If you're a B2B company and you needed to have one million error today, you need to have two and growing at double the rate or, or, okay, not growing today, but not losing customers. Right. So, so what that means is investors are saying, okay, we'll invest slightly later. We will track longer. So as mentioned that pipe is very fat, the engagement pipe is fat, but we'll track longer sales cycles for customers longer, uh, 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 approval to investment is longer. And this is across the, across the world. This is, I mean, happening in Silicon Valley as well, right? It's nothing to do with Zoom or just India. It's just human behavior, right? That you're going to tighten your risk management a little more and uh, you know, invest with more scrutiny, without a doubt. Absolutely. You know, um, I know we're almost out of time, but this one final question I want to ask you. You know, I remember in one of your earlier interactions, uh, you told us that raising a fund is actually time, time, uh, raising a fund for a fund is uh, yeah. 10x harder than actually doing a startup. Now, do yeah. you see, given the times that we are in, is, is it getting any more tougher? Yeah. Actually, you know, on a lighter note, you should talk to our friend Sanjay Mehta also because he's called it 100x. So he'll probably say it's 100x. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, know, uh, um, you know, yes and no. I think uh, the interesting part of founders raising capital is like what you see is what you get, right? So if I'm Ritu, Ritu if I'm coming and pitching to you and I like to say, you know, I've built this ceiling. If you like it, that's what it is, right? As a fund, you have to go and say, okay, I'm, here's one ceiling. Uh, and then I'm going to do the ski link in, you know, 10 different country, uh, 10 different countries and say, okay, come and talk to me when you've done that. Right. So it's a bit of a concept sell. Uh, and then you have to have a track record. You have to have the right team. Uh, it's become more competitive. Having said that, I think, uh, you know, institutional brands and institutional platforms would stand out even more because I think, you know, what, what happens is when there's a crisis, people, uh, 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 brands and uh, trust. I mean, this is about trust, right? What is all this? This is all about trust and about uh, um, confidence, right? That you're going to back a VC that is going to then make responsible decisions, back responsible founders that will build companies responsibly. It's like a chain. It's a food chain. And how do you trust that? That comes with the track record, right? So in that sense, I would say the best performing funds and the known funds will not have uh, as tough a time as uh, as uh, as uh, newer funds, 
Having said that, there's some crazy ideas. I mean, I'll say this on in public also in in the in, in the valley. For example, let's say cannabis, right? Cannabis is actually a, is legal. It's not manufacturing cannabis, but delivering it. The fintech around it, uh, because there's use for medicinal medicinal usage. Yeah. Now there, a ten million dollar fund in the new sector may actually find it much easier than a larger fund or than a startup because they they it's a new field, it's a green field, it's a white space. So I think it really depends. It really depends on on you know what the space and the sector is. Well, finally, since you mentioned the valley, I mean you know as um, as a country we have always looked at best for some ideas. While I know our prime minister talks about uh, vocal for local, but you know sometimes you have to take inspiration from ideas and then have to sort of try and see how your country can fit into. So if today if uh, potential startups are to look in the valley for some trends, what what exactly they should be looking at? Cannabis, you mentioned. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll just uh, separate this. Uh, I think you know the valley is the valley because people from all around the world have gone there, right? The okay. people they have made it special, and many of them are Indians. So yeah. I think we have a lot of credit to take for that. Secondly, I also be careful that you know we don't necessarily look up to it and with awe or anything. I think it's just that they got a head start, right? I mean, so, I mean, venture capital was in, invented there in the 50s, and in India it's new, literally I would say from the 2000s. So they've got a sort of unfair head start. Uh, I think on the B two B, they're clearly ahead, right? If you look at cloud and infrastructure and storage and Slack and Zoom, they all tend to start from there. Having having said that, Eric Wan is Chinese, right? He started Zoom, uh, and uh, look at Jan Tom of WhatsApp is Ukrainian, right? Uh, Sergey Brin himself came from Russia, right? His parents came, so I mean they're all immigrants who started it. On the consumer side, I think there is learning. Uh, if you look at you know what Facebook can be, I think one learning and again. I'm never glorifying the valley over India or over any other place, but one of the learnings is that um, uh, just the UI, UX, and um, very quickly to uh, kill what doesn't work and accept what works. I think sometimes we have a tendency to, you know, just go at it and be determined. But again, like you said, right? Are you going the right direction, right? Uh, yeah. You, you, what is your? I, I, okay. Are you listening? I think that's the right word, right? Are you listening to your users? Um, are you, uh, uh, you know, are you doing enough uh, customer discovery, right? Uh, I think that is something to learn. Uh, to uh, and it's not just about India. I think founders keeping our ego aside and learning. Uh, we are often we, are, like I like like to say, we are always in pitch mode, right? All of us in pitch mode, right? We like to sell, but are we listening, right, to what the customer may want or the customer may not know what they want? But can we listen and do that? I think they're good at doing that, right? They're just very very. In a very, they taught in an open environment to listen and then develop something versus just pitching. Sure, thanks very much, uh, Sanjay. I think this was a great talk, and thank you so much for sharing some great ideas. So my couple of takeaways from uh, the big talk, and of course, you know, you shared some brilliant, brilliant stuff here, uh, is really that you know today uh, we're sitting in a pandemic. So I think what is more important for startups and prospective startups also is to try building. For what could be post-COVID, and therefore you should uh, not look at uh, current uh, currently the times as a, a lack of opportunity, but you should think of it as an opportunity to build something new, which could actually go on to become uh, becoming much bigger going forward. And secondly, funding is always available for a good idea. So I mean, as long as your idea is on solid grounds and you can do a, uh, you think you have a customer in the market, you can go ahead and do it. And thirdly, you know. Even if today you feel that opportunities are less for you, whether you're unemployed or whether you feel that you have some great experience and you can do a startup, just don't think of doing a startup. You can do so many other things in the ecosystem. Yeah. So thank you for joining us, Sanjay. Any final words from you? Oh, and, and I'd also share that, uh, you know, we, we're always in a sharing economy, but I would share more on the human capital side, right? I think we're all, we're all lonely, but we're in the empathize mode. I think incredible value to sharing across Share with your friends, share with other startup founders, and just share good things, bad things. I think this is a time to communicate and band together. So I'll just add that. But thank you for having me. It was a pleasure doing this, and hope uh, some of the insights were helpful. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, I appreciate. Bye bye.